In this video, you will learn how to calculate the effect of an aperture stop on the aberrations of a lens. An aperture stop is a hole that you put either in front of the lens or behind the lens. For a single lens, if you put a card with a hole in it in front, the aperture stop has the entrance pupil. The chief ray always passes through the center of the entrance pupil, and if you move the aperture stop, you move which ray serves as the chief ray. Look out on the image surface, there is a little bit of change in where that chief ray ends up striking the image. And the movement of an aperture stop is referred to as stop shifting. And when the aperture stop is behind the lens, it functions as an exit pupil. And if you move the aperture stop, you select a different ray to be the chief ray. The marginal ray is the ray that comes in parallel to the optic axis, striking the farthest clear diameter of the lens, and it has to pass through the aperture. In the case of an aperture stop behind the lens, the size of the aperture needs to be adjusted to accommodate the marginal ray. If you move the aperture stop, you will change the size of the necessary aperture when it's behind the lens. In front of the lens, the aperture stop has no effect on the marginal ray. The marginal ray height is already set at the radius of the aperture, but behind it will change, and we will see that in our simulations. The aberrations which are affected by the movement of an aperture stop are the chief ray aberrations, coma, astigmatism, distortion, and lateral color. You won't affect spherical aberration, you won't affect Pett's fall curvature, and you won't affect axial color by moving the stop. Let's demonstrate some of that. Spherical aberration arises when parallel rays at different heights strike the optic axis at different places, forming the image at a slightly different axial location. If you move the aperture stop, it doesn't affect those parallel rays. They are still going to strike the optic axis where they strike it. So the aperture stop movement does not affect spherical aberration. Axial color, or axial chromatic aberration, arises when the marginal ray splits due to dispersion in the glass and different color components of the ray strike the optic axis at different locations and form the image at slightly different axial points. Moving the aperture stop has no influence on splitting of the marginal ray, so the axial color is not affected by the movement of a stop. Lateral color is affected by moving a stop. The chief ray is always the ray that pierces the center of the entrance pupil. If you move the aperture stop, you move the entrance pupil, you select a different chief ray. Now look at the effect out on the screen between these two locations of the aperture. Because they're different chief rays, they strike the lens at different heights, and they split a different amount. And you end up with a different splitting on the image between the different components of the light. That is lateral color that separation in height of the image surface pierce of the different colors. Thus, moving the stop does affect lateral color. To quantify the effect of a stop shift on aberrations, we need to define the stop shift parameter as to the bar over it, which is the difference in chief ray invariant before and after shifting, divided by the marginal ray invariant. A and A bar are refractive invariants. They are quantities that pertain to the chief ray and marginal ray, and they don't change on either side of a refracting surface. Quantities with a bar above them pertain to the chief ray, so A bar, U bar, Y bar. U is the angle relative to the horizontal. You have a refracting surface. Here's the horizontal. In comes the chief ray. And the angle relative to the horizontal is U bar, because bar pertains to the chief ray. If a quantity after the interface is used, it's normal to use a prime. Y is the height. Y bar for the chief ray, Y for the marginal ray. The marginal ray comes in parallel to the optic axis, so it has an initial angle relative to the horizontal of zero, a height y, and the size of the aperture stop defines which ray serves as the marginal ray. x is the distance between the aperture stop and the lens. Chief ray is always entering at the center of the entrance pupil. As you move the stop, what does not change is the angle of the chief ray. That's the defined field angle. If there is no aperture stop, then the chief ray will pierce the front of the lens at y bar equals zero. When there is an aperture stop in place, it pierces the front of the lens at y bar star, some value that's not equal to zero. 
I want to evaluate this numerator, a star minus a, by putting in the definitions of the chief ray invariance, star being after stop shifting, no star being without a stop present. And since the angle u doesn't change, n u bar star minus n u bar is zero. And since the height of the chief ray when there is no stop is zero, y bar is zero. So the numerator in the stop shift parameter is n, index of refraction, in front of the lens, times the chief ray height, times the curvature of the surface. The denominator of the stop shift parameter is the marginal ray invariant. And since the angle relative to the horizontal, u, is zero, the marginal ray invariant is just nyc, giving us a stop shift parameter that's the height of the chief ray after stop shifting divided by the height of the marginal ray. And a little trigonometry, looking at this purple triangle over here, gives the height of the chief ray after stop shifting in terms of x, the amount of stop shifting, and u bar, the angle of the chief ray, in the small angle approximation, hence no tangent. What this tells you is that the stop shift parameter is linear in the amount of stop shift. That makes predicting what happens to the aberrations quite straightforward using the stop shift theorems. With the stop shift theorems, you can look at how the Seidel coefficients change with the stop shift. The spherical aberration doesn't change, so the Seidel coefficient for spherical aberration is the same for and after. The Seidel coefficient for coma after the stop shift is whatever it was before the stop shift plus the stop shift parameter times the Seidel coefficient for spherical aberration. This has two key implications. One is that since the stop shift parameter s is linear in position, the change in coma as you move the stop is linear in where the stop is. A second implication is that if you don't already have spherical aberration, you can't change the coma by moving the stop. Astigmatism goes out to the stop shift parameter squared. You can simplify this expression down to the ratio of chief ray invariant to marginal ray invariant squared times the Seidel coefficient for spherical aberration. Astigmatism changes with the movement of the stop more strongly than just linear. Petzval curvature doesn't change when you move the stop. That's somewhat intuitive because Petzval curvature is determined by the curvature of the glass and reflecting surfaces. This isn't the usual expression for the effect of stop shift on distortion. I'd simplified it so that coma and astigmatism are out of the picture. So you can see clearly that in order for distortion to be impacted by moving a stop, you need to have either field curvature present, S4, or spherical aberration present, S1. The stop shift theorems extend to chromatic aberration. Axial color, which we've talked about, does not change when you move the stop, but lateral color does. Lateral color's coefficient changes linearly with the stop position, but you have to have axial color present for that to happen. Make a note of that because I'm going to test that out in my spreadsheet. And for those of you who use Zmax, these coefficients C sub L for axial color and C sub T for lateral color are CLA in Zmax for axial color and CTR for lateral color. Using a subscript L can be a little bit confusing for axial color. The L is for longitudinal. You have to actually try to not confuse C sub L with lateral color. It's not. It's longitudinal or axial color. So here's the lens we're going to do our testing with. A single lens with these two radii, a thickness of 10 millimeter. We're going to make it out of NBK7 glass. And we'll have a stop that will move around. It won't be stuck at 22 millimeters. I'm going to move it all over the place. And we're going to see what it does to things. So let's go into Excel. Look at how I put a stop in the Y and U spreadsheet. And let's move it and see what it does to the aberrations. I have separate sheets for the stop in front and the stop behind the lens. Let's look at the stop in front, which is the easier case to handle. The object is at surface number zero. It is located infinitely far away from the lens, 10 to the ninth. The index of refraction out there is one. The marginal ray comes in parallel at a height of y above the optic axis, hence the an angle of zero, that's parallel. For the chief ray, we draw on the maximum field, which is a user input over here in cell I13 of 10 degrees, and this is 10 degrees in radians. The stop is surface two. The thickness is 20 millimeters, meaning it's 20 millimeters from the stop to the next surface. The index is still one. Because the stop is flat, the refracting power is zero, and nothing happens to the marginal ray as it passes through the stop. But now this is where we have our first trick that we need to perform. The chief ray has to be forced to be zero at the point of the stop, and so it is. Its angle doesn't change because the stop is not a refracting surface. I is the angle which is incident to the the surface. 
Then the front surface of the glass is surface 2. It has a radius of curvature of 124.7 millimeters. The curvature is just the inverse of that. The thickness is 10 millimeters, meaning that's the thickness of the glass, which has an index there. And the surface power can be calculated given the radius and the index after the surface. The marginal ray is still at 5 millimeters when it strikes the surface. U prime is the angle relative to the horizontal after refraction, and using Praxor ray trace equation number one, we have a value for it. I is the angle relative to the surface normal. The chief ray now strikes the lens at a different height because it was at zero at the stop. Now it's at the glass. It was going at this angle of 10 degrees. Calculation of a straight line gives us that height. After refraction, it has that angle using Praxor ray trace equation number one. Then the back surface has a radius of curvature of minus 85.8 millimeters. Thickness is 97 millimeters. That means that's the distance from the back glass surface to the point where the marginal ray strikes the optic axis. That's calculated in cell I11. Let's go over there. And we can see that it's just a straight line from the back surface down to the optic axis. The index after the back surface is 1. The surface power is calculated for the back surface. The marginal ray emerges from the back surface with this height and this angle, and it proceeds then to the optic axis. The chief ray emerges from the back surface with this height and angle, all of them calculated from Praxor ray trace equations 1 and 2. From this, we can get the effect of focal length, which is calculated from the incoming parallel marginal ray height and the outgoing marginal ray angle. Now you might ask, what do these two quantities have in common, the incoming marginal ray height and the outgoing marginal ray angle? The marginal ray is launched virtually from the principal plane at the incoming height. This is in fact how you calculate effective focal length. When calculate the various invariants, the chief ray invariant for each surface, the marginal ray invariant for each surface, and the optical invariant for each surface, and from that, we can calculate the aberration coefficients. There's spherical aberration calculated for each cell. And if you'd like to see how to do that, I recommend you watch my video on spherical aberration. And there's coma, which I also recommend a video on coma. At the time of this recording, I have not done the videos yet on astigmatism, field curvature, and distortion. But those are coming. And the total is just added up from surface 1 to surface 2. The stop does not produce any aberrations because it's neither a refracting nor a reflecting surface. Let's see what Optic Studio comes up with for these Seidel coefficients. So I have the same lens put in here, and I have a stop 20 millimeters in front of it, and the Seidel coefficients are in this bottom row here, and the Seidel coefficients that it finds are the same as the Seidel coefficients that we just determined using the Excel spreadsheet to within a few percent. Now we can put the stop in the back. Behind the lens is a little more complicated. When the stop was in front of the lens, all we had to say was the incoming chief ray at the maximum field has to go through the center of the stop. But now with the stop behind the lens, that same rule applies, but it's not so obvious how to calculate it. So we have the maximum field shown here in green, and it goes through the center of the stop. The question I have is, at what height does it pierce the lens surfaces? That needs to be determined. That wasn't quite so straightforward. Let me show you how I figured that out. That's what this gray box down here is for. So what we do know is that the chief ray goes to the center of the stop. What we don't know is what are the heights of the chief ray at point 3 and at point 1. So the chief ray comes in, hits the lens at point 1, refracts, has a transfer to point 3, refracts, and goes towards the optic axis. What we do know is u sub i, the incoming angle, that's the field angle, 10 degrees. And we know the geometry of the lens and we know s, the distance to the stop. So write some equations at each one of these points, at the refracting points and for the transfers. So at point one, using the refraction, Praxor ray trace equation one, and then for the transfer, we write out the equation of a line, Praxor ray trace equation two, and then at point three, we write the refraction, at point four, we write the equation of a line. We have four equations and four unknowns, and in about eight lines of algebra, you can solve them for y1 and y2, which you have to know to finish the spreadsheet. I'll do the algebra for you, and you get these expressions, which we're going to put into the Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, I only want to do this once. The expression for the outcoming height, y sub 2, was more complicated, so I broke it up into these different steps. 
in cells I19, I20, and I21, and from that calculate Y2 and cell I22. The incoming height, Y1, I just put the whole expression in directly. So now I know the height of the chief ray at these two places, and so I can proceed to do the calculations. You'll notice this minus 5.8273 shows up here in cell D12. It's just like the preceding spreadsheet, except now I have the stop in the column after the glass. The rays first hit the front surface of the glass. The marginal ray is at a height of 5. After refraction, it has an angle of minus 0.013. The chief ray strikes the glass at a height of minus 5.82. That's y sub 1 down there and it has a refracting angle relative to the horizontal at 0.132. Then the ray transfers to the back surface too, which has the same radius, and the marginal ray now is at a new height with a new angle. Marginal and chief rays emerge from the back surface and proceed 20 millimeters to the stop, where now the marginal ray has a new height, which can be calculated just from the equation of a line, and the angle doesn't change because there's no refraction at the stop. The chief ray is supposed to go through the center of the stop, and there I have a zero, I actually just forced it to be zero, and it has the same angle. So we can calculate the marginal focus by extrapolating the marginal ray all the way to the optic axis, the same way as the previous sheet. Now it's important to calculate the aperture radius. We didn't need to do that when the aperture is in front. It was a user-defined quantity. But now the aperture radius is the height of the marginal ray wherever the aperture stop is located and that's in cell F8. And then we calculate the invariance, and we calculate the Seidel coefficients. And again, the stop doesn't contribute any image aberrations. So we have these totals. Let's take a look at these aberrations in Optic Studio to see how they compare. The stop is located 20 millimeters behind the second lens surface, and the Seidel coefficients are very comparable to the Seidel coefficients that we just calculated in Excel, to within a few percent. Similarly, for axial color, we can go ahead and put a stop in here. If you watch the axial color video, you'll see how this spreadsheet is put together. And I added a stop. Now, if I change the stop, what should happen to the axial color? Absolutely nothing. So right now it's at 20. Let's go ahead and make it 0 and look at LACX, or the optical path difference, CLA. And you see I changed it from 20 to 0 millimeters, and nothing happened, as expected. Let's look at lateral color. Now, lateral color, we concluded, does vary with the stop position. And you can watch my video on lateral color to see how this spreadsheet is constructed. Right now, the stop is 20 millimeters in front of the lens. Let's make it 10 millimeters in front of the lens, and let's see how the optical path difference CTR and the lateral color on the image screen changes. It changes a noticeable amount. And we can do a soft experiment because I previously predicted that the change in lateral color should be linear in the stop position. So if we have a stop at zero, it's at the lens. Let's look at lateral color and then we'll look at optical path difference. So they should do the same thing. They have a lateral color of 0.013. Move the stop to 10 millimeters in front of the lens and it's 0.039. Move the stop to 20 millimeters in front of the lens and I should get 0.067. Move the stop to 30 millimeters in front of the lens. It does appear to be behaving linearly. Let's check that out by tabulating it. This time I did put down the optical path difference instead of LACL. Graphed it versus stop distance, and it sure looks like a straight line. It has a slope of minus 000129, which is dimensionless. What should it be? Well, we predicted that the change in lateral color is the original lateral color plus the slope. Chief ray angle times the axial color divided by the marginal ray height. Put in some numbers, the chief ray came in at 10 degrees or 0.174 radians. The axial color was minus 0 0.003799. Go back and look at that right there. Marginal ray came in at 5 millimeters above the optic axis. So I might expect the slope to be minus 000132, so it's pretty close to minus 000129. Now let's look at an achromatic doublet. We have to add some more glass surfaces, and if you would like to see that happen, you can see my video on axial color. We have these four surfaces. 
the surface three and surface four are the same surface if it's a cemented doublet. You can put a distance between them, which would be a matter of making that something other than zero. I'll leave it at zero. These radii and these glass thicknesses were calculated using the achromatic doublet design recipe. And with the primary axial color equal to zero, we would expect that moving the stop will not affect the lateral color. So let's try it. Right now the stop's at 20. Let's put the stop at zero. Move it all the way up to the lens and see if that double 0335 changes. It does not. Make it 30. It does not. 40. So there's no change in lateral color when there's no axial color present. Let's just change one of these radii so that there will be axial color. Change that 13.49 to 17. So we'll move the stop from 20 millimeters to 0 and watch the minus 0 0.036. It changed. So if you have axial color, you can change the lateral color. If you don't have axial color, you cannot change the lateral color. Okay, you can do all kinds of these soft experiments if you write your own YNU spreadsheets to include aberrations and a stop.